Hello YouTubers, this is Gold Standard Caesar924 coming at you with another video. Um, this is going to be a wrestling related topic for today and as a matter of fact this is going to be a review on a particular WCW wrestling event that happened 17 years ago this month. And, um, and it was held at the uh, MCI Center in Washington DC which we now know as the Verizon Center. But yeah this was actually pretty historic as well because it was already built um, yeah, they just opened up like a couple weeks prior to Starcade, and they were actually one of the uh, first events where the where the um, yeah Starcade. Yes, this will be a review on WCW Starcade 1997. So um, yeah, basically the MCI Center had just opened up, and Starcade 97 was the first uh, event to be scheduled at that particular venue. So. Um, it's also very significant as well, and, um, and it's very significant in the sense that this was the penultimate culmination of a year-long feud that had happened, and um, and the main event was a World Heavyweight title match between Sting and the champion Hulk Hogan, and um, in this sense, you know, the NWO angle was really hitting its stride at the time of this that this pay-per-view took place. Um, and, you know, with the NWO angle, you know, very groundbreaking in a sense. And it had been going on since the summer of 1996 when Scott Hall and Kevin Nash had jumped ship from WWF into WCW soil. And um, basically, we all know the hostile takeover match at Bash of the Beach 96. You know, Hulk Hogan uh, turned on WCW, sided with the NWO and, you know, revealed to be the third man. And, um, you know, NWO was very groundbreaking in the sense that, you know, unlike most stables that came before it, this stable, you know, was, a, was based on a loose entity, you know, threat, destined to threaten WCW and, you know, put them out of business for good. And, um, and you know, basically with the gang mentality, um, they're, you know, they've had the tendency to assault um, to assault their wrestlers, assault a lot of authorities, a lot of employees um, associated with WCW, and basically having no sense of pride whatsoever, and that put a lot of heat on them. And you know their signature uh, spray paint can that they were most known for using when they once they uh, have their opponents beat and lay down the ring canvas or whichever area, and basically they would always spray paint the. NWO on it so um, a very significant stable and um, really was the main contributing factor in the, the reason why WCW prevailed over the WWF in the Monday Night Wars for the for most of the 1996 to early 1998 time period um, so that was pretty much the NWO there and then on top of that, you know, you also had, um, you know, with Sting, you know, he, you know, he had that whole surfer Sting that he was most known for, you know, with the bleach blonde hair and, you know, the face paint that he had. So uh, eventually, you know, with Sting and Hogan, um, you know, Hogan, you know, had ditched the red and yellow in favor of the black and white. And Sting also went through a transformation as well. And, um, you know, Sting, uh, basically they did this whole thing where, you um, someone else that was impersonating Sting had attacked his best friend Lex Luger and everyone believed that Sting had betrayed WCW but it turns out that you know that there was another Sting and you know uh, with the real Sting uh, Steve Bourne Sting um, basically believed that you know the WCW had turned on him and the fans had turned on him as well and uh, declared himself a free agent so basically Sting was uh, you know, he didn't really see Sting wrestle, and the next time he showed up after that, you know, he started debuting the, you know, the black and white face paint, and, you know, the long black trench coat, uh, very loosely inspired by the Brandon Lee movie, The Crow, where which got the inspiration from, and normally he'd be, like, up in the rafters, or up in the, you know, near the crowd, or the, the box seats, or somewhere, um, somewhere that the, the, the the commentator commentators or the wrestlers weren't able to see him or such. Um, 
Yeah, so he also had even the signature baseball bat that he also had. Um, yeah, just pretty much reinventing his character into something very relevant and something very um, that fans could really get behind of because we all we don't we never know when Sting's going to show up because he's such a mystery. And that you know that infamous promo that he mentioned that you know that no, that nothing's for sure you know um, yeah so Sting hadn't been wrestling um, for over a year since the Fall Brawl '96 and um, it took them over a year um, up until Starkey '97 where he uh, he ended up signing the contract and that you know he wouldn't face any other NWO besides Hulk Hogan who was you know the reigning world champion for most of the most of the time that Sting was hanging above the rafters. So, um, yeah, basically that was set to be the main event for Starcade. Um, so before I get to the, before I get into discussion with the Sting Hogan match, I'm also going to run down the match card and basically, um, lay out my personal thoughts on the matches. Um, so here we go. So uh, the first match we have here is the Cruiserweight title bout between the champion Eddie Guerrero defending the belt against Dean Malenko. Um, yeah, this has actually started off a pretty tremendous match. Um, you know, these two wrestlers aren't strangers to any one another. Um, you know, because these guys had, you know, wrestled in other uh, wrestling promotions, uh, most notably ECW, with their infamous Hustle City Showdown and the two out of three falls. Um, yeah, so this is actually just as good as those two matches. Um, you know, Eddie Guerrero was kind of like the heel going into it. Uh, you know, basically working the knee of Dean Malenko. Um, now there was like only one thing that kind of peeved me about the match was the one, was the part where they, uh, when Eddie and Dean were wrestling at ringside, uh, basically what happened, um, Eddie Guerrero, uh, utilized the steel steps and placed it on Dean Malenko's knee. And then basically Eddie just um, used like a drop kick or something, and then basically working on the you know Dean Malenko's injured human part, human anatomy part, um, and you know the referee didn't call like a disqualification or anything. So I was kind of wondering if that might have been a DQ, even though it just they never said that there was no DQ or um, the fact that the steel steps were kind of like used as a weapon. So I was kind of confused on that part, but. You know, that was probably like a minor nitpick there. Um, but the match continued on. Uh, Dean Malenko tried to go for the Texas Cloverleaf. Um, you know, Eddie eventually gets the... Eventually regains the advantage. And, you know, Malenko um, gets frog splashed by Eddie. And, you know, Eddie retained the Cruiserweight title there. Um, yeah, so this is actually a really good match. Really hot opener. Um, you know, what else more I could say? Um... You know, just a really enjoyable match. So, um, you know, Eddie Guerrero, you know, just had a really good cruiserweight title run. You know, he had um, a very tremendous match, you know, with Rey Mysterio, you know, um, a couple months prior and even at World War Three, and, uh, you know, with Rey Mysterio. So, um, you know, I really enjoyed his run there. Um, then, you know, Dean Malenko as well, you know, with, you know, when he ended up uh, having his few matches with Jericho and... Um, you know, basically had a pretty, you know, these two wrestlers, you know, um, just very uh, technically sound, just very tremendous athletes in their own right. So, uh, yeah, so that's basically my thoughts on the on the opening bout. And then we get to the uh, six-man tag match between the Steiner brothers along with uh, Ray Trailer. And basically, for those that don't know who Ray Trailer is, he, you know, the, was the big boss man in WWE. And they took on the NWO, uh, consisting of Scott Norton, Vincent, and Randy Savage. Um, now, originally, it was supposed to be Conan, but instead, they, uh, Randy Savage ended up substituting for Conan since he no-showed. And um, this wouldn't be the fir the only match where a certain wrestler uh, no-showed in the match. Um, but, you know, you have the six-man tag, and... Um, wasn't really anything memorable or noteworthy. Um, I think the only downside is just the fact that, you know, that they kind of wasted Randy Savage, uh, especially since he was, um, you know, feuding with DDP for most of 1997. Um, just a really 
uh, hectic feud, a really tremendous feud, but a very personal one, and really well done in terms of that, uh, the quality of that, uh, the direction of the feud. But, um, yeah, so after that whole DDP stuff, you know, he kind of gets relegated, like, early in, earlier in the cards, so um, I was kind of questionable on that. Um, but yeah, the match didn't last long, and uh, Randy Savage ended up uh, picking up the win for his team. So um, yeah, so the NWO went over to Steiner's. Uh, it's kind of an okay match. Um, nothing more I could say. Um, you know, the Steiner brothers were the tag team champions, so maybe they could have defended the belts at that night. Or. Um, yeah, I mean, they were kind of splitting up the Steiner brothers not long after this. You know, Scott Steiner joined the NWO after turning on his brother Rick. Um, but, I don't know. Maybe they could have done... They could have started uh, the dissension between the Steiners at Starcade here. But it is what it is. Um, so, it was an okay match, really. And then we get to uh, Goldberg versus Steve McMichael. Uh, the third match on the card. Um... Basically, the whole the whole build to this consisted of uh, two former NFL football players. So you had Goldberg, who was the uh, defensive tackler of the Atlanta Falcons, along with Steve McMichael, who um, was the linebacker of the Chicago Bears. So basically, you know, Goldberg had debuted around September of '97. And uh, basically, you also have, like, Steve McMichael, who around this time, um, you know, he was a former Four Horsemen member. And um, basically, Ric Flair broke up the Four Horsemen after um, the events where Kurt Hennig turned on the Horsemen and uh, sided with the NWO at War Games. So, um, yeah, so basically, Flair, uh, during, like, a phone interview, uh, declared that he, you know, disbanded the Horsemen for the time being. And, um, you know, Steve McMichael, Chris Van Wall went on to uh, venture out in their own singles runs. And uh, Ric Flair, you know, continued his whole beef with Kurt Hennig. So, um, yeah, getting back to Goldberg and Mongo, um, they've kind of teased the feud with a couple of confrontations on Nitro. And, um, and Mongo was supposed to face Goldberg at World War III, but instead he fought Alex Wright and Mongo went over Alex Wright. So after a couple postponings, um, Goldberg, uh, um, yeah, Goldberg and Mongo have their opportunity to wrestle at the biggest pay-per-view. Um, yeah, so uh, Goldberg ended up fighting Mongo, and uh, kind of a it was kind of a really an uneventful match. Really, I mean, the only thing that was memorable was the part where like Goldberg uh, shoves Steve McMichael crashing through a table. And, um, and there was no sign of a DQ or anything like that. But, uh, but the match continued on, and uh, Goldberg won with the jackhammer. Um, it, it felt really sloppy, you know, especially Goldberg. And um, just not really much to say, really. But, um, yeah, Goldberg went over Mongo in a pretty uneventful match. And then... Um, yeah, so Goldberg was still pretty new. I think he was still a heel at this time, and uh, you wouldn't notice that he was actually a heel. But um, yeah, th th yeah, he was going through a winning streak, which wouldn't really be uh, brought up by the announcers until many months later. But um, but this was definitely a sign of things to come for Goldberg. But um, yeah, this was his first uh, real feud was against you know Steve McMichael. So uh, he won in that match and. Um, just kind of um, pretty much a dud, really. Nothing really noteworthy to write home about. So there you have it, that. And then we have is um, a Ravens rules match between Chris Benoit and Perry Saturn. Now, originally this was going to be against Raven, but he decided to opt out of the match and decide to uh, have Barry, Perry Saturn uh, substitute for him instead. So um, basically, what is Ravens rules? Um, basically, Ravens Rules is uh, basically your typical no disqualification match. Um, you know, Raven had a you know came over in the summer of '97, and um, and in a promo, uh, he basically talked about you know when he signed the contract with WCW that you know that they agreed that you know Raven could 
uh, wrestle in the match whenever he wants, wherever he wants, and how he wants it. And basically all of Raven's matches consisted of like no DQ hardcore matches, which he entitled uh, Raven's Rules. And this also can apply to uh, all the other flock members, you know, that wrestle in the same roles as Raven has. So uh, but that's basically the thing that was kind of strictly uh, reserved for Raven and the flock members. Um, so Benoit and Saturn was um, actually a pretty entertaining match. I actually somewhat enjoy it. Um, there was like one notable spot, you know, especially, you know, because the flock was sitting in the front row crowd. Um, yeah, so they were normally tending to, like, interfere in the match as usual. And, um, there was, like, a little spot where, like, Billy Kimmon went for, like, a shooting star press off the apron. And, um, you know, basically crash landing on Chris Benoit. Um, yeah, that was actually a, a spot that I enjoyed or a spot that I could remember. Um, yeah, so there was, like, a lot of back and forth here and there. And, um, you know, after all the overbooking, you know, Raven, uh, interfere in the match, spike Benoit with the even flow DDT, and, um, yeah, and this basically allows Saturn to take over from there, and basically he, uh, won with the Rings of Saturn, uh, submission maneuver, so Saturn went over Benoit in that match, um, so like I said, I, someone, I pretty much enjoyed this match, um, you know, and Benoit would end up getting, uh, his match against Raven the following month that sold out. So, um, yeah, so that's basically that. Um, then we get to, uh, Lex Luger taking on Buff Bagwell. Uh, basically this match kind of, um, not really much build up except they kind of emphasized on who had the total package or who deserves the rights to that nickname. So, yeah, so they pretty much emphasized on, you know, their physique and their muscles and, um, just basically, um, just showing off who they were, you know. Um, yeah, so this was pretty much the worst match on the card. Uh, it ran for, like, over 15 minutes, which I don't understand how it ran longer than it did. But, um, basically, crowd was sort of dead. Um, typical interference from the NWO. Um, you know, Lex Luger tried to fend them off. You know, he gave uh, guys like Vincent and Randy Savage a torch rack. And then um, Scott Norton interfered and basically uh, basically stopped him from using the torch rack and helped Buff Bagwell to get the three count. So Buff Bagwell went over Lex Luger. Um, yeah, so that was basically another match that was very uneventful, like the Goldberg Mongo match. And, um, I, and even the Bagwell Luger was, I'd say is a lot worse because it, you know, mainly because it, um, uh, ran too long. Um, so that's really that. Um, the U.S. title match came on afterwards. Uh, yeah, Kurt Hennig defending the belt against, uh, Diamond Dallas Page. So originally this was supposed to be a cage match between Ric Flair and Kurt Hennig. And, um, you know, like I mentioned early in the video that Hennig had turned on Flair and the Horsemen. And then, um, basically, Flair and Hennig, you know, were feuding in a series of matches at Halloween Havoc, World War III. And, um, yeah, they're supposed to have, like, a penultimate match to kind of give out, like, the payoff or conclusion to the feud in a cage. But, um, but they had a segment on Nitro where uh, the NWO beat up Ric Flair backstage and... It got to the point where the announcers informed the viewers that you know Ric Flair was injured and unable to compete at Starcade. So yeah, so they had DDP come in and substitute for Ric Flair. Um, yeah, so they had the match. Uh, actually, you know, still pretty good match. Um, you know, just a. Uh, you know, DDP, you know, fought to his best, you know, coming off really hot of that feud with Randy Savage. Kurt Hennig, you know, had been holding that U.S. title for quite some time. And, um, yeah, there was a couple of boring fests, like, you know, when they were kind of constantly locking in rest holds. But uh, the match flowing started to get a little better, you know, uh, midway and a little towards the end. And definitely like that counter uh, when Kurt Hennig Irish whipped DDP and then DDP, like, hopped over him and nailed the diamond cutter and basically won the uh, United States title there. 
So uh, that was actually a notable spot I liked. Um, yeah, definitely a pretty, pretty good match. Um, and DDP, you know, deserved that U.S. title. Um, so yeah, so this was a sign of things to come for DDP as well. Um, yeah, so that, that was basically that. And then we have is the uh, the control of Monday Nitro. Um, this was a special attraction match between uh, Larry Zbyszko and Eric Bischoff. And this also has Bret Hart as the special referee. Yeah, so this is basically Bret Hart's, uh, one of his uh, first appearances in WCW after, um, you know, after the Montreal Screwjob incident where he, you know, eventually left the WWE and jump shipped over to WCW. Um, yeah, so basically the whole buildup had been building for a couple months, you know, um, you know, the NWO always had a tendency to, uh, basically interrupt the commentators for Monday Nitro. They were always, you know, coming in and basically trash talking them. And, you know, Larry Zabisco, you know, stood up and basically, um, stood up against Eric Bischoff and the NWO, uh, especially, you know, him and Scott Hall, you know. They were kind of like the two notable enemies that played a huge factor against uh, Larry Zabisco. So um, that was also that. And um, in the extension of the feud, um, you know, because, you know, they were fighting over the control of Monday Nitro, uh, what happened was at the, uh, the go-home show for Nitro before Starcade, uh, the NWO ended up um, tearing down the WCW Nitro set, basically overhauling the arena to make it into NWO Monday Nitro and um, you know just basically littered with a lot of flyers and you know the lights were a lot dimmer and um, you know basically the whole ex the whole idea of it originally was supposed to be the fact that uh, the NWO Monday Nitro was meant to be a, uh, a full-time TV show for Monday Nitro uh, from you know here on out so NWO would have had their own show Sort of like, um, kind of like what they did when NWO had their pay-per-view called Sold Out. But it will only have, like, strictly NWO guys wrestling each other. And, um, and around this time, they had uh, Ted Turner pitch an idea with Eric Bischoff to produce another WCW program called Thunder, which would debut a couple weeks after Starcade. Um... Yeah, that was the original idea, and um, you know, the, it was sort of a precursor because they were gonna try and make a brand extension out of it, and you know, WWE would you know borrow some of the brand extension idea from WCW and basically running with it throughout most of the two thousands. Um, but yeah, WCW actually uh, considered this idea at first, and um, you look at some of the pay per view posters. From 1998 like they had like WCW slash NWO um, yeah you see that a lot in those pay-per-view posters and uh, you know especially um, the time when the when they released WCW NWO Revenge for the Nintendo 64 yeah so that was basically the idea of it and um, and they were gonna do like a little brand extension you know with the NWO having their own show and WCW having the new one but um yeah, just so because of like they had like very low ratings at the time, uh, because they spent so much time uh, overhauling the uh, Nitro set, so the whole idea of uh, having an NWO TV show was basically scrapped, and um, and they actually still have an NWO Monday Nitro T-shirt to kind of prove that, and um, and there weren't really a lot of those. Um, a lot of those uh, TV shirt, uh, the the shirts that contain the NWO Nitro logo on it, so it's pretty rare. Um, but anyway, I'm kind of been raining on. So uh, yeah, Larry Zbysko and Eric Bischoff they had their match, um, dragged very long. I mean, it should have been a very short, sweet to the point match. Um, and basically, to make kind of makes matters worse, you know, they kind of had Zbysko won by disqualification. So that just kind of felt very anticlimactic in a sense, and um, but you know you know Zabisco should have you know he should have won like in a decisive fish, decisive finish, and um, you know Bret Hart ended up raising Zabisco's arm and you know won the match regardless. So um, yeah, so that so Zabisco and Bischoff was just kind of 
shouldn't have dragged on. But it should have been more of a, like an entertaining brawl just to see Bischoff get his ass whipped by a. Uh, by this point, he was uh, Zabisco was a pretty much a retired wrestler turned commentator. But um, but yeah, regardless, you know the Zabisco Bischoff match was just kind of there really. So um, should have been a short match, just like I said. And then we get to uh, the main event, uh, the World Heavyweight title. Uh, Hulk Hogan defends the belt against Sting. Um, very anticipated match. And, um, and I basically ex uh, explained the belt early on in the video. And, um, and now I want to discuss about the match in general. And um, it's just very disappointing. Um, you know, they spent a lot of time with the belt, which they did a really good job on just to give viewers, you know, sense of, uh, you know, give them a sense of, you know, hope that, you know, with Sting winning the belt that, you know, WCW triumphs over the NWO and uh, putting an end to the NWO and putting a nail in the coffin for good. But then you get to the match and um, it was just, it was just so disappointing. I mean... You know, I mean, start off pretty slow, a um, couple rest holds for the most part. You know, crowd wasn't really digging in the match. And, um, you know, Hulk Hogan got a lot more offense than Sting, but kind of making Sting look like a total chump. Um, you know, Sting had a couple offense as well. You know, they brought a little bit at ringside. Sting tried to go for a Sting splash, but Hogan uh, moved out of the way, and uh, Sting landed hard on the silver guardrails. Um, but to kind of make matters worse, um, you know, you had Nick Patrick who was, um, who, who had been the referee for the NWO, but by this point he had been kicked out and, uh, and then eventually they kind of played up this whole angle and, um, you know, Hogan went for a leg drop on Sting and then, you know, re uh, Nick Patrick made the three count and they, and they initially claimed that it was a fast count, but if you watch it, uh, closely, it was just basically a regular three count and, you know, the moment that happened, the crowd just it had absolutely no heat. And, um, and you know, everyone was kind of confused what was going on. And uh, even I was kind of confused what's going on when I was kind of like re-watching, um, when I was like watching the match on here. And, um, and then basically they shot, uh, they, the camera cuts to, uh, the scene where like Bret Hart was, um, somehow, uh, starting to, have some sort of a control over the match and um you know basically he knocked out nick patrick and um basically restarted the match sting started getting advantage with the sting splashes and then ends with the scorpion death lock and basically uh sting won the world title after hogan submitted um and then you have like the wcw roster empty out in the arena and um that was basically the end of the show. So, um, yeah, so Sting and Hogan, you know, just uh, one of the most anticipated matches, you know, during the whole build to it. And um, the execution just turned out to be kind of like leave you scratching your head, you know, very mind boggling. Um, you know, I mean, we could blame all we want about who's to blame for, you know, the fuck up of the match and, um, you know, it's, it would have been better if they had, like, the NWO came out and just basically have Sting knock them out. I mean, I mean, they did something like that, you know, early on, um, you know, with Lex Luger when he fought Hogan to win the title. And they had, like, the whole NWO coming out to, uh, you know, to help Hogan and Luger fend them off. You know, that that's what should have been in this match. Um, and I know they kind of redid the match at Super Bowl Eight with a similar finish. But, uh, but to me, that's what uh, their match at Starcade 97 should have been. And um, and turns out they just kind of made it to be like just your regular standard match. And um, Sting barely got any offense. And, um, you know, even though he won the, the WCW world title, you know, he uh, basically they what happened is like they ended up like um, having a rematch the Nitro after Starcade. And then basically they, uh, they basically cut off the match. Like they basically ended the show during the middle of the match. And, um, and then basically they had to like, um, 
they basically had the J.J. Dillon uh, announce that on the first episode of Thunder to announce what happened at, you know, between Sting versus Hogan. And, um, and it, it turned out like Hulk Hogan won back the title, but then all of a sudden they just decided to vacate it and then do the rematch, which Sting won, but, you know, they never really gave Sting like a proper run with the WCW world title. And, um, and even then he was like second fiddle because they were kind of doing like a dissension storyline between Hulk Hogan and Randy Savage. And which would eventually lead to the whole um, NWO splitting into two factions, you know, with the Wolf Pack and the Hollywood stuff. Um, just the, you know that by that point that the, the NWO angle was just starting to uh, really, they started really running out of ideas and, you know, started to jump the shark in a sense. Um, and, you know, Sting not having a proper run with the belt, which kind of hurt his character. And, um, it was, it was just kind of really terrible in hindsight. And, um, you know, overall, WCW Star K97, you know, just a, kind of like a so-so pay-per-view, you know. I mean, any matches I would recommend, um, Eddie Guerrero and Dean Malenko for the Coots White title, DDP versus Kurt Hennig for the U.S. title. And, um, yeah, that was basically about it. Um, maybe Benoit versus Saturn, but... Um, it's kind of a mixed bag for some people. I heard people said that they didn't like the match, but I didn't really have a problem with the match, really, at least compared to, like, some of the other ones on the card. Um, I also forgot to mention that the giant Kevin Ash was supposed to wrestle as well, but Kevin Ash no-showed, so, um, so basically, uh, they kind of replaced it with a segment by Scott Hall doing his, uh, doing the survey time that he normally does, and you know, Giant ended up uh, coming out and basically uh, giving a power bomb to Scott Hall to send him a message. Um, yeah, so basically that was supposed to happen, but that never did. Um, yeah, so false advertising was also a contributing factor as to you know just why this pay per view, um, just why I didn't like the pay per view, um, just the fact that they just uh, kept changing around the card and substituting people for other wrestlers and not sticking to the original plans like they should and um you know this is pretty much the the peak of wcw um you know they just dragged the whole nwo thing for way too long but um but anyway i've just been kind of rambling on once again so i like to apologize for that but, um, but there's just so much that was going on during that time. And, um, even for, you know, for good and for bad, but, um, but yeah, so it doesn't deny the fact that Star K97 was a very, very significant pay-per-view. And, um, yeah, so that was basically my thoughts on the show. So it was just kind of a pretty disappointing pay-per-view. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it for this video. Uh, thank you guys for watching, and uh, till next time, this is the Gold Standard Caesar 924 signing out.